Hello, hello. Welcome to a brand new episode of the SaaS Sprints podcast, the podcast for our content marketers in SaaS. And I'm your host, Yag. In today's episode, we're going to learn how deeply understanding the buyer journey and intent informs content strategy, especially if you're executing ABM. To discuss that with us, today we have Adam Turinas, the founder and CEO at Health Launchpad, an agency that specializes in account-based selling and marketing to healthcare. Adam has spent more than two decades in marketing across multiple industries. He founded and ran a healthcare technology firm with great success until the ABM bug bit him. He is also the author of the book titled Total Customer Growth, which focuses on ABM and ABX strategies to win customers for life. I'm personally thrilled to be catching up with him today and raring to go with a lot of curiosity. So without any further ado, hey ho, let's go. Hey Adam, super happy to have you here. How are you doing today? Very well, Young. Delighted to be on your show. Um, I love always. I love your podcast. I love the energy in them, and um, looking forward to the questions and really digging in some of the things that I'm very passionate about, like the buyer journey. Yeah, absolutely. I'm as pumped and uh, looking forward. So yeah, let's get started. You know, in your book, Total Customer Growth, you talk about using buyer journey as a base to create content. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, as a content marketer, I couldn't be much happier. At the same time, you know, we all understand that this is not a linear journey as most people would initially think. And all of us now clearly understand that it can go any way. So let's start with talking about how do you look at the customer journey differently so that from there we can go into the content strategy side? Oh, yeah. What a great, what a great point. Yeah, it is <laughs> the buyer journey, <clears throat> particularly in business to business, is anything but linear. You know, we, we as a company um, focus on complex sales in particular. Um, and that's why account-based marketing is so important in what we do. Um, and we focus on healthcare. So in complex sales, uh, sales cycles are long. In healthcare, they're just longer because everything takes longer in, in healthcare. Um, and so trying to simplify the buyer journey um, is a, a tricky thing. And we spend a lot of time about thinking about the way to do it. Um, I, I, you know, I, th I think that getting overly precise on the buyer journey, you know, like having a 20 point buyer journey is most likely going to be wrong because that might represent, you know, a small percentage of, of how the audience buys. So what we do is we focus on the sort of the big buckets, the stages that a buyer collective or a buyer circle goes through. Um, and, um, I was inspired by a couple of books. Um, so one of the books, which I'm sure you covered is they ask you answer, uh, by the awesome Marcus Sheridan. Um, but a another book, which I think is, is really a brilliant book on business to business marketing is called the challenger customer. And it's written by the guys who came up with the challenger sale and they did a ton of research on how buyers buy. And I, I like the, the model that they use, which sort of simplifies the way buyer collectives work. And where it's basically, you know, an organization has a, a particular problem that they need to solve. It might be an accounting problem. It might be a revenue cycle problem. It might be a patient experience problem. It might be a customer satisfaction issue, whatever it happens to be that they're told, hey, we need to go fix this. And so a group is, is assembled. Uh, maybe informally to go fix this problem. And so the first thing they'll do is they'll spend some time talking about the problem and thinking about not just how we're going to solve it, who or who the vendor is, but what are the types of issues that we are, we're trying to address? Um, and typically they, you know, this is a, a challenging issue for them. There's a lots of different points of view. So the first stage in a buyer journey is defining that problem, problem definition. The second stage is, well, how are we going to solve it? And, and again, they may have some biases to who they want to work with at that point, but they're thinking about, well, should we build it in house? Should we use existing technology? Should we, um, should we, 
go go get some third party technology or should we hire somebody to build something custom for us so there are all sorts of different options and how they can solve problems interesting thing in this book was that it actually identifies that that's the area the solution definition stage is where buyers actually have the biggest challenge and you tend to need the most help then the third stage is then well okay so we've decided that we're going to solve this problem by uh, go lic by licensing a third party software so let's go evaluate vendors and so they'll go off and start the vendor vendor so, uh, vendor evaluation process and then the fourth stage is then decisioning the interesting thing is is that that vendor evaluation stage two things one is it's the easiest stage for them once they get to the point where they've decided on how they're going to solve the problem, coming up with and an, an evaluating vendors is actually relatively easy. It's where they need the least amount of help. The second thing, and this is kind of where I think is one of the most important aspects. Um, and if you kind of remember one thing, remember this thing, which is by the stage that they start talking to vendors. So if you if you're getting, you know, an RFP, I think it's 57% of the vendors, the, sorry, the buyers have already made a decision on who they're actually going to work with by the time they reach out to vendors. So if you get an RFP, it's by the stage you re receive it, it's probably too late. It's more likely to probably too, too late. And so, you know, so the way that we organize the buyer journey is four stages, problem definition, solution definition, vendor evaluation, and then decisioning. And then what we'll do is as a process is we'll develop personas, you know, personas have their value. Um, but we don't spend a lot of time agonizing over the personas. What we spend the most amount of time is is thinking about how the buyer collective goes through those four stages. Um, once we've got those and we'll, we'll at each stage with different things that we'll look at. So, for example, in the problem definition stage, what are the triggers? What are the things within the organization which trigger an organization to go look, look, uh, look, uh, look for a solution? And then at each stage, what are the key questions that they're trying to get trying to answer back to, you know, the, the they ask you answer approach to how you're doing it? And so it's a really, comp you know, it's a really granular process. It uh, takes several workshops with clients to, to, to do this. But uh, the artifact of it is a very detailed buyer journey that looks at the buyer collective, looks at the stages that they go through and identifies the issues and questions that they have at each stage. And so that's kind of like the, the key thing. We then use that to go create content. So the content is an answer of the questions at each at, at each stage. Does that does that sort of explain, you know, give you a sense of how we how we think about this? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it kind of um, makes me want to take this to several tangents because there are so many parts that spurs out of what you just said. But here's the interesting part, right? So when the, it comes to content, you know, understanding this and the kind of content that we usually see on SaaS websites are two entirely different experiences. So what I mean by that is uh, just like you explained, you know, somebody has made a decision that, hey, I'm at this point ready to buy a solution. I've decided that I know what my evaluation criteria is. And then they have decided that, OK, if I have to increase the revenue by 25 percent in this quarter that, and they've decided that I'm going to purchase this kind of a software that's going to help me get there. and when you go and look at each of these software websites, everybody unanimously says that, hey, we will help you get this, do that. But the point is, they know it. You know, your job is to show how you're going to do that and why. So right. where I'm getting to with all of this is that how do we connect this to the kind of content that needs to be created for each stages? Because at the same time, uh, because it's not linear, we cannot assume that, hey, everybody is going to consume 12 pieces of content before they go to, they're going to actually sign up. So how do we map a piece of content to the buyer journey that you just explained? Well, um, so two parts to that. First part is um, the content that you create should be in answer of the questions that you identify at each stage of the buyer journey. Um, so, you know, for example, at a problem definition stage, it could be, um, 
who who else you know like me has solved this problem before what are the current trends in this particular issue and so you might go create a, a piece of content that looks at examples of how different companies have solved this issue or you might create a trend report so that might be in answer of that stage later in the journey maybe at the evaluation stage just skip over solution stage the evaluation phase it's like it's it's more comparison type content and that's actually not just say hey hey we're the best but it's actually helping a customer compare and contrast and so you know you everybody you know it, it, it you know you should I think anybody who's who who knows anything about content should know that when it comes to competitive comparisons, actually competition helps a buyer understand why they should choose you. Not just because you're better, but it's sort of like, oh, okay, you you do these three things that they don't do. I didn't even know those were important. And so those are the kinds of things that are so the, the we'll use the buyer journey to make decisions about what the different types of content are. Um, but, the, but the challenge with that is, is that if you take the buyer journey and you translate that into a content map or in a content calendar, you could end up with 50 pieces of content that you need to do. And so that, that so then the real, just, you know, the, the second part of this is then deciding where are you going to start? And that kind of depends on where your business is at. So, if you're if you're in an active market that's actively buying what you do, you probably need more sort of like mid to lower funnel stuff, something which is sort of latter stage. Strong focus on that to make sure that when somebody's in market, that they find you through SEO, or when the, if they come to you through a paid search, that there's content that answers those questions, and they can they can quickly see why they should put you in the consideration set. The other example is, let's say it's it's more of a missionary selling where it's like, you know what, I'm selling something that there is really isn't anybody else that does it. Um, but I've got to convince you that you need to solve the problem the way that we solve the problem. And if I convince you that that's the way that you do it, I'm the only game in time. That's a sort of like that's that's the conclusion that, that you're going to you're going to come to. So, I mean, you know, like it's, it's not a B2B example, but. You know, Tesla is a great example. It's like in a world where there really aren't, you know, things have changed now. But when Tesla came out, there really weren't many. There were there was like one or two other, you know, e electric vehicles on the on the market. So I didn't need to convince you that Teslas were better. They intrinsically are more beautiful and better designed. Doesn't really that almost doesn't matter. What I need you to convince you is you need an EV. You need to move to an electronic vehicle. And so it, it sort of it, it it depends from a business situation, you know, your, your priority on what content you focus on depends on what's going on in your business and what the priority is. Is it missionary selling or is it getting people, intercepting people at the point where they're starting to make decisions? I absolutely love it. And uh, especially, you know, the part where you touched about uh, the SEO side, you know, that's pretty interesting because while I was going through your book, um, I, I felt like, you know, you are uh, recommending using intent data and SEO to understand where a particular buyer is in their journey. And yep. uh, this is one area probably where we might actually get into a debate, but this is very important for all of our listeners here. So what do you mean by intent data when you speak about it and uh, yep. how does it really help? Okay, so intent data is any type of int uh, data that gives you a signal that a company, an account, might be interested in what you do. And, and the notion is being in market. Okay, so that would be that there. And it comes in different forms. Um, there's first party intent data, which is data on your website. So somebody's downloaded a white paper. Uh, you can identify that an account keeps coming back to your website and looking at your solutions page. That's one type of intent data. Second party, party intent data is, uh, for example, uh, sites like Captera and G2, which are comparison sites that, that I indicate that, you know, somebody's actively in market because they're really, if they're on those sites, they're, they're, they're doing an evaluation. So that's second party. And you can buy those leads, right? The th third party intent data is the real sexy stuff. I, I mean, I think it's like magic. Um, and so there are companies like Bombora, ZoomInfo, 
Um, there's a uh, Intentif now from uh, Netline. There are a bunch of them actually. There you go. There you go. There, there are there are a bunch of them. There 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 are quite a few of them. Um, and what it does is it aggregates buyer behavior across the web, across the internet, and anonymizes it and it identifies what different companies are interested in and allows you to make to um, <coughs> use the topics that are most relevant to you to decide whether or not that a company is in market for what you do. So for example, if you sell uh, CRM software and uh, maybe it's CRM software that's specifically focused on the legal market. So you can um, use these in sources of intent data to look at wh what law firms are actively looking at CRM and what are some of the things that they're particularly interested in. So if you take, I don't know, you know, God knows how many thousands of law firms there are in this country, uh, around the world. Um, and you can basically say, okay, of the 50,000, 20,000 law firms out here, these thousand right now are really actively interested in CRM. So as a marketer, I'm going to make a decision that I'm only going to focus on these guys right now. And I'm going to double down on marketing to these thousand accounts because that, th that intent data is telling me these guys are in market. So that's that's a, that's what intent data is. So here's where you know the the debate aspect comes in. So I have um, used these intent data in the past, and here's here's my factor, right? So, but just because a company is searching for certain keywords doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually in the market. Say, for example, somebody yep. searching for CRM might mean that they are trying to read a few things around it or maybe they are building an internal crm and they are trying to um, do some market research as well right. so this is where i think yeah i i completely agree with you when it comes to the first party data and the data that is very much in your control you can actually understand the paths that they are going into but when it comes to third party is it reliable to build a content strategy based on that is my primary question so, so <laughs> it's uh it's not perfect um it's a signal, um, not, uh, not, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a signal, right? So it may or may not be, yeah. um, it's almost like a, you know, it's, it's sort of like a fuzzy radar. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. so I actually, the, the, the analogy I've been using recently is it's a bit like card counting in a casino, um, in the regard that if you're playing blackjack and you count cards, um, not that I do, uh, but if you were playing back, uh, but if you uh, playing, if, if you count cards, it doesn't guarantee you're going to get every hand right. But it means that over the course of three or four hours, you're going to get more hands right than if you hadn't been card counting. And so we see this, right? And I'll give you a great example, right? Um, where we would we'll get the SDRs and the BDRs using the intent data. Now, so what it says is, oh, okay. I'm, I've got a list of a thousand accounts that I've got to call that the team's got to call. We're only going to, you know, that these 200 appear to be in market. Now, number one, doesn't make them easier to get on the phone. They're just as hard to get hold of. The second thing is, does it mean that every 200 of those are going to go say, oh, wow, thank you for calling me. We were absolutely, we are in market for what you do. Uh, but what you do, what you do find is, in terms of a probability is more of them are likely to engage than if you than if you were calling a cold list and so we we find that actually you have a better hit rate when you use intent data than when you don't so is it perfect no it's not perfect is it getting better probably but um it does improve your odds the other thing is is that I don't think you use intent data in isolation. You use it in combination with other factors. And so, you know, we might use intent data in combination with, you know, reaction on a website. So, you know, did they fill out a form? The second thing is, is like, are they responding to advertising on LinkedIn or programmatic ads? You've got to look at it holistically. So, it, you know, I guess the short answer is intent data in isolation is not perfect. 
but it does help improve your odds if it's if it's used right. That makes a lot of sense. Now let's get to the actual, uh, you know, content part. Let's let's talk about engaging these set of accounts, and um, you know, you have an engagement planning framework. So let's uh, deep dive into that. Maybe if you can give us initially an overview into what the framework is all about and how it helps right. creating content across yep. the buying stages. So first of all, the framework is. <coughs> based on the buying stages that we identify in the buyer journey. Right. So again, looking at problem definition, looking at solution definition, then evaluation, and then decisioning. What's different is we don't use the traditional AIDA, you know, awareness, yeah. interest, decision, interest, action, decision. right? Um, we don't use those um, as our starting point. And the reason is, is that AIDA is what I'm interested in as a marketer. A consumer doesn't care about whether exactly. they're aware, a customer, they don't care. It's like, oh, I, I am not aware of your company. And so I need to take an action to become aware. They don't do that, right? They're out there <laughs> solving a problem. And so the way that we approach it is start, put yourself in the customer's shoes and the customer is in the process of making, uh, of defining a problem. And your job is to make them aware that you can help them with that, pro that problem. So it does map to AIDA, but we don't start with that as a, as a premise. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we take a view of sort of like, um, it's a content led view, um, but there's essentially two sides to the coin. One side of the coin, which you just covered before, which is, What's the type of content that we should be creating? So the content is in answer of the questions and the issues and the triggers identified in the buyer journey. So that's number one. The second side of the coin is it's about getting that content in front of people. And so, you know, we'll, we, we do two things in parallel. We'll do a detailed content development, content planning. And the other thing that we'll do is also do a really detailed exploratory of the different ways of getting the content in front of people. So LinkedIn ads, great way to get, get, you know, to, to target people precisely. Don't use it in isolation, but it works pretty well. Later in the journey, how are you using different email sequences or social selling to, to get engagement? Um, earlier on in the process, more at the problem definition stage, what types of partnerships are there associations that you should be teaming up with and focusing on that are going to get you in front of that buyer audience where you're using your content as essentially the currency to get those conversations. Um, and so, you know, if you develop content around a particular theme, turn that theme into a webinar, reach out to the associations that have relationships with, you know, go back to the lawyers, right? So maybe there's an association of um, business development and marketing people in the legal field. What you do is you reach out to them and say, hey, we developed a, an educational series on this. Would you be interested in having us present this to your members? And they said, sure, for a fee, we'll do a webinar program with you. And so that's the way that we would, would develop it. So the plans, you know, um, don't all look, they, they have some current common themes, but we tailor them according to the buyers and the, what, what's in, uh, what, uh, what's, um, you know, what's important. The, the, the third part about the way that we develop engagement strategies is it's about creating an ABM motion. So what that means is, is that early on um, in a campaign, you're trying to figure out the accounts that are in market and get them warmed up. Then you get trying to get them, <coughs> the buyers engaged at those and then converted. And so there are a bunch of, it's all about joining up those tactics, you know, using intent data the whole way through um, trying to help the business development reps, uh, the SDR or the SDRs, whatever you call them, um, understand what they need to do to reach out, you know, giving them information about the particular buyers that'll ha help, help them personalize the way that they're reaching out to messages. So we think about it, it's, it's quite an intricate thing. Um, but um, again, starts in answer of questions that are picked, come out of the buyer journey. Content is driven out of that. 
And then it's about developing a joined up program which helps move buyers down the buyer journey or at least identifies them as they're moving down the buyer journey. I, I don't know, really know that we physically move people down the buyer journey. It's like that's pretty arrogant. But at least we can identify that they're in, in motion um, as they do that. So that that quickly also brings a couple of questions based on what he just said. You know, uh, while you say this, um, it also gives me a feel that certain parts of it are scalable where you can do it at scale. But at the same time, when you look at um, a specific webinar, for example, just like you mentioned, is it or do you plan content for each specific account or do you look at a particular buyer type and spread it across because some of the examples are probably directly dependent on an SDR distributing it versus a LinkedIn ad like a situation could be more at scale for the set of accounts that you have shortlisted using intent. Where you prioritize and where you start is really dependent on what you're trying to do at that particular moment in the business, right? I mean, if, you, if it's early on and you're just getting started, you're probably going to focus much more on the awareness and, you know, and the problem solution, problem def, it, problem solution definition stages than you are on the conversion stages. But on the other hand, if you know, you've got an active market that's actively in market and it's all about arming the SDRs, it might be something different. And uh, as you were talking about this engagement and distributing it and repurposing it, let's also talk about the mix of uh, you know organic and paid in this. So how do you go about deciding which pieces are organic? Uh, where do I get paid? And this also directly contributes to, uh, you know, how we are going to measure outcomes from this. Um, so I don't, I, I view those as uh, equally important. You know, I love, <laughs> I love both. I love all my children. I, I love my organic and my <laughs> paid. Um, organic, the way that we, we, we typically think about organic is, is that we, um, we make that um, it, it's, it highly, it's it's tightly coupled with our content development process. Um, you know, it's, there's a there's a nuance right between if if you lead if you lead with SEO, you have content which feels like it's just written for Google, not for a human beings. Um, on the other hand, if if you leave SEO, you know, if you isolate SEO from the content process, if it's not tightly coupled with it. Um, you end up having to go back and then optimize everything after the fact. And so, you know, we uh, when we're doing a strategy engagement for a client, the SEO and the content uh, teams work in 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 uh, in concert with each other, uh, alongside um, each other. So, um, you know, so that's uh, what we do uh, in terms of paid. I mean, paid is it's like looking at lots of different types of paid tactics, whether that's, you know, paid social with LinkedIn, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Google ads or whether it's programmatic, it's more about how you design a program. It, are we focused on lead generation, bottom of the funnel? It just, it kind of depends whether, you know, what the priorities are for the client. Um, and, you know, yeah, sure, there's, uh, it's interesting. I actually think the connection between SEO and content is more important than the con connection between SEO and paid search. I mean, sure, there needs to be some, you know, connection between the two of them. They should be thinking about the terms that they're using. But actually, um, SEO, I think, needs to be closer aligned with content than it does with paid search. And as I was going through your book, one of the key factors or as a theme that I've noticed is that you know, a lot of your strategies are heavily ABM oriented. Of course, you know, I come from a SaaS background, so it I, I kind of distinctly see the difference between the two uh, in terms of how you engage a set of target accounts. And uh, in many ways, if you look at it, it feels like there's a relay between marketing and sales and customer success at each stage of the journey. Yep. Is my interpretation right or do they collaborate all along in every part of the journey yeah. itself? I think that the... Um... You know, in a in a total customer growth organization, the trifecta is sales, marketing, and customer success. And within sales, BDRs in particular. Okay, um, and so, but who you involve when sort of depends on where you're focused. What we find is on their ABM and their total customer growth journey, companies tend to go through three stages and it's kind of it's almost like you could say it's, it's year one year two year three in year one it's about okay 
we need to use ABM because we have long sales cycles and high value deals and complex buyer collectives, all of the, the conditions that really demand that you consider ABM. And in that year one, what you're trying to do is pilot, optimize and get to you know, a, a, a plan that allows you to scale it. In year, but it, typically for most companies, not all, but for most companies, in year one, you're focused on customer acquisition, right? It's all about new customers, not existing customer growth. Year two is about scaling that. So you might try in year one, you're focused on doing customer customer growth, uh, you know, customer growth and using ABM. Um, and, and so there it's about the, the integration between sales and marketing. And then in year two, it's about then scaling that out across the whole organization. But again, you're primarily focused on customer acquisition. What we find is this, that it's in year three that companies tend to actually flip it and spend more time thinking about how they use ABM um, as a way to grow existing customers, which is it, it's sort of slightly, in my view, it's you know, kind of backward because... Um, ABM, the roots of ABM are really actually an existing, growing existing customers. Um, and as we all know, right, you can get more, it's easier to get more business from existing customers than it is from to acquire new customers. However, everybody's, a, a, you know, it's kind of focused and addicted to the new logo acquisition. But back to your question about sort of when does customer success gets involved? I'd love it if customer success was involved throughout. And, uh, but typically they don't get involved until you really move into the third stage, which is how do you use it for growing existing customers? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All of us would like customer success to have context from day one, but yeah, it is also important to involve them at the right time and uh, not burn them. Yeah, absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. All right. So that brings us to, uh, the second half of the podcast, which we call the rapid fire section, wherein uh -huh. I'm going to shoot, uh, five pointed questions at you. The questions may be short but the answers need not be. You can go free flow, whatever comes to your mind. So are you ready? Go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here's question number one. Twitter is now called X. Do you like it or hate it? Dumbest branding decision I have ever heard. <laughs> Hold on. Honestly, I just, he, um, just that's it. That's the answer. Dumbest branding decision ever. <laughs> I, right, I, right. I, I do not buy into this. Oh, we're trying to create the next WeChat. It's like WeChat is a stupid name as well. I mean, it's like if, if, if he thinks Twitter is a stupid name, WeChat's are equally a stupid name. WeChat has built a multi-billion dollar organization, leader in mobile payments in China around the name WeChat. If you, could have done, if you can do that with WeChat, you can do it with Twitter. I don't buy the branding story at all. Dumbest branding decision ever. I love that. <laughs> awesome. All right. So here's uh, question number two. If you had to choose only one metric to measure the success of your content, what would that be? Content. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the obvious answer is revenue, but that's just, that's an unfair way of measuring content. I don't know if this is the most important, but I think it's one that I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I it always impresses me is if, if, if it's one of the highest ranking or the highest ranking piece of content on your website, I think that's a very important metric, um, which is rated say. So, so for example, you know, with um, the Health Launchpad website, the homepage is, has actually consistently been the number two um, most engaged piece of content on the website, um, second to a piece of content that we wrote about three years ago which is a sort of a, you know, a, uh, sort of, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Flagship content, right? Um, and so I feel really good about that content. I think that that's a sort of successful piece of content because it, it, it helps to attract people who've never heard of us. Um, it's relevant and it's helpful to them. And, um, and it's had a positive halo on the rest of our website. Right. So question number three, what is one ABM weapon that every company has, but they don't realize the value of it? The, the thing that I, th that I think people should find out is customer commitment, not customer satisfaction, but how committed are your customers genuinely? And when you understand who your committed customers are, um, 
you should then figure out how you can create a program that celebrates them and activates them on your behalf. It's an untapped asset for most companies. Yeah, yeah. No, I was looking for a weapon that you already possess in the company, but companies not realizing the value of what they already have. Uh, it could be it could be a role or it could be a tool it could be a person anything well i think i think customer insights data i mean if you you know you should have it first of all and it's genuinely underutilized i think people sort of you know do an mps score and then pay lip service to it but yeah. i think you got to you got to i think people don't don't use uh customer satisfaction data as effectively as they should do right right totally makes sense Right. So question number four, in three words or less, what's your advice to somebody starting a career in content today? Know the customer. Love it. On point. Awesome. Right. Here's the final rapid fire. If you couldn't use intent data anymore, what would be your next best bet to build the right audience or the right target accounts? Um, yeah, it's interesting. We do plenty of... Uh, if you mean third-party intent data, yeah, there's yeah. actually there's actually plenty of uh, accounts where we don't use it, um, either because the company's the client's not ready to, because it's expensive, not ready to do it, pull the trigger on it, or it just sometimes it's just the topics aren't there. So um, you you know use um, pay careful attention to which accounts are responding to your advertising and your marketing um, and pay careful account to which accounts are landing on your website um, and focus on those. So, so you're, you're looking at engagement primarily. I'm looking at engagement as you know, engage, you know, engagement, as long as you can identify who is engaging, yeah. that is, a, that is a, that is an intense signal, right? Yeah. 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 It's probably Absolutely. the most, I mean, it's, it, it you know, back to your point about does third party intent data work? That's telling you these people are interested because they're responding to your message. That's awesome. So you hit all five questions out of the park with ease. That's absolutely killing it. Right. So we are coming towards the end of our episode. And uh, for all our listeners who have been listening to us, if they want to connect with you, what's the best place to find you? So um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Um, so it's Adam. Chirinas, there's only one of, one of me on, on LinkedIn, T-U-R-I-N-A-S. Um, or check out our website, which is Health Launchpad, healthlaunchpad.com. Um, or, uh, well, also, you can also find me on Amazon because you can find our book, Total Customer Growth, on Amazon. Um, so there are three places that you can find me. But start with LinkedIn. That is awesome. All right. Um, so as we are wrapping up, would you have a parting message to all our listeners? Uh, our listeners are primarily SaaS content marketers and uh, would love any last parting message from you. It, it goes back to what I said in the last, in the, the, the three, three word question, which is it's about knowing, knowing the customer. Um, I think if you're, if, if you're trying to master what you do, um, I, I believe that you can be, and you can be the expert, the authority in what you do by knowing the most about your customer. If you know more about your customer than anybody else, you know, you're, you, you've, uh, you've created a, a moat around your, yourself and your business. Yeah, yeah. That's a great place to end this episode. Thank you so much for a wonderful message. And Adam, it was a blast having you. Thank you so much for making the time and uh, this awesome conversation today. Thank you, Yarg. I've enjoyed it.